Over the past 10 years, the use of immunotherapies in the treatment of cancers has exploded. What was once considered a pipe dream by many cancer researchers has now become an exciting therapeutic success story. Since 2011, there have been seven checkpoint inhibitors, a type of immunotherapy approved by the FDA, which have become the standard of care for 16 different types of cancer. In this series, we talk to the researchers that are making these therapies a reality and explore the technologies that make this promising field possible. It's a pretty small mission. We want to cure cancer um, using the immune system. I mean, basically, when Sean Parker had the idea to create the institute and he asked me to lead it, it was really with the idea that we could use the immune system to start really curing cancers. Now, that was back in late 2010, 2011 that he and I started talking about this. At the time, this was just when anti-CTLA-4 was getting an approval as a drug. Anti-PD-1 wasn't even in the mix yet. And so it seemed like this was, we were part of a world that was isolated out in the wilderness, you know, with people like, you know, Jim Allison and Bob Schreiber and others who had been at this and would always be in the back room of the big meetings and never, but of course, things have changed in the last uh, six or seven years, and now immunotherapy is the hottest thing going, and you go to a meeting and every talk is on immunotherapy. The term immunotherapy is actually an umbrella term for a number of different modalities that are all designed to use the body's own immune system to help fight cancer. The specifics of each therapy differ, but they all rely on a deep understanding of how the immune system is regulated and how that regulation can be modified to get the desired outcome. It has been known for some time that the immune system plays an important role in monitoring the formation of potentially cancerous cells. It's estimated that an individual cell can have as many as 20,000 DNA damaging events a day. The vast majority of these are identified and repaired by specific DNA repair pathways. Those cells that do acquire a malignancy that are not repaired are usually removed by the body's immune surveillance system. This generally involves cell-mediated immune mechanisms that rely on differentiating between self and non-self antigens. Often, this DNA damage results in a single point mutation in a nucleotide that leads to a unique peptide that may be recognized by the immune system as non-self. These tumor-associated antigens are presented on the surface of cells in conjunction with major histocompatibility complex or MHC molecules. This TAA MHC complex can then be recognized by a T cell with an appropriate T cell antigen receptor. But in order for the T cell to become activated, a complex mix of co-stimulatory signals are required. One example of this is the CD28, CD80, 86 activation signal. This second signal then activates the T cell to allow it to carry out its effector function. But just as there are signals that activate T cells, there are counteracting signals that can inhibit activation. These inhibitory signals, mediated by cell surface proteins known as checkpoint molecules, normally play an important role in regulating autoimmunity, but their actions can also potentially inhibit a robust immune response to tumors. When a T cell interacts with an antigen-presenting cell, the cell surface marker CTLA-4 on the T cell can interact with CD80-86 on the dendritic cell causing an inhibitory signal to be sent, essentially down-regulating the T-cell's response to the antigen. These inhibitory signals can also be found on some tumor cells. In these cases, the tumor expresses the antigen PD-L1, which binds to PD-1 on the T-cell. This inhibits its activation, even though the T-cell receptor has bound the MHC tumor-associated antigen complex. Thus, the tumor cell escapes the immune system surveillance by co-opting checkpoint molecules. But if an antibody to either PD-1 or PD-L1 were added to the system, it could block the interaction and prevent the inhibitory signal. This is the premise of the class of immunotherapeutic drugs known as checkpoint inhibitors. 
By preventing the inhibition of the immune response, this new class of drugs allows the immune system to recognize and fight the tumor cells. Nobody, in fact, uh, there was thinking of the checkpoint molecules, or we used to call them co-inhibitory molecules, uh, with relation to tumor immunity. They were mostly thinking about its role in autoimmunity because it can regulate T cell responses, you can regulate threshold of the T cells to self-react to antigens. And you can see the deletion of these molecules and CTLF4. When you delete the CTLF4 molecule and the mice come down with disease and die within six weeks with tissue infiltration, autoimmunity. Then the same story with PD-1 molecule expressed on T cells. You delete it, you get a massive autoimmunity if it's on appropriate strains of mice. And initially, they were all thought to be co-inhibitory molecules that evolved to regulate T cell expansion. In fact, they are normally used for T cells to contract once you have an infection or like a virus or a bacteria. So your T cells expand and they actually infiltrate your lymph nodes and spleens. And, and ultimately, once the infection has been cleared, you want to shrink the system and bring it back to homeostasis. And that's where they play the most important role is that actually they bring down the whole size of a robotar back to the normal, almost normal. Cancer is controlled autoimmunity. We're trying to break tolerance there to generate an autoimmune response against the cancer cell, which of course has a lot of similarities to other self tissues, uses a lot of the same regulatory pathways to shut down immune responses and so, the way I look at it is it's uh, sort of two sides of the same coin. The inhibitory signals being targeted can come from a number of sources, but they have been extensively characterized in professional antigen-presenting cells and in a subset of T-cells known as regulatory T-cells. The primary purpose of this T-cell subset is to suppress an immune response and maintain homeostasis, preventing autoimmunity. Although the exact mechanisms are still an area of intense study, what is known is that they appear to work through four basic modes of action. These include the production of inhibitory cytokines, suppression by cytolysis, suppression by metabolic disruption, and suppression by the modulation of dendritic cell maturation or function. These interactions between the immune system and tumor cells are complex and lie at the heart of immunotherapy. As we begin to understand the molecular basis for these interactions, we can start to see how we can use them to address a disease like cancer. Well, immunotherapy, I think, is, is changing because of the knowledge of the immune system. I mean, all of the clinical breakthroughs that are coming about came from mechanistic preclinical in-depth studies that understood their mechanism, CTLA-4, PD-1. It was understood before it went into the world of cancer as how it inhibited autoimmunity or how you could re-energize a T cell response to a, a viral infection in a mouse, LCMV, so a typical a virus model in mice. This all came about because of good preclinical evidence on what they did biologically. And now, as the negative co-stimulatory world is expanding and people understand how T cells work and how the signaling pathways you know, come about, you start to understand how positive and negative signaling interacts together. And if, if you get usurped by negative signaling in the tumor microenvironment, these antibodies to PD-1, to CTLA-4, to LAG-3, to TIM-3, to a bunch of these others, you can block a negative and enhance the positive signaling of T cells in the microenvironment, and that's what's going on. It's not by luck, it's not by chance, it's because of good basic science. Uh, the focus uh, sharply went on to this role of these molecules on immune cells in tumors. And that's because of two reasons. Number one, their blockade in tumors showed success in human tumors. And number two is that if you respond to checkpoint blockade therapy, you are pretty much immune and you get long lasting durable responses, which you can't see with chemotherapy. See, this is one of the advantages of checkpoint blockade or immunotherapy, is that you get long lasting responses. So in targeted therapies, you can give a drug, 
it will impact the tumor, tumor will shrink, and six months later or a year later, the tumor comes back with vengeance, and such that the, the tumor does not respond to the targeted therapy or chemotherapy anymore. But one good thing about the immunotherapy is it's almost like you're immunizing or you're vaccinating the immune system against the tumor. So once you give the checkpoint blockade therapy, you're blocking these inhibitory molecules on the immune cells and immune cells start recognizing the tumor, they start proliferating against the tumors and they kill the tumor. And finally, that you have immune memory such that if the tumor comes again, you have an army of lymphocytes ready to react like as if it was an infection. Some of the early work on immunotherapies focused on identifying tumor-specific markers using monoclonal antibodies and, in some cases, creating antibody drug conjugates directed towards the tumor. In addition, some early immunotherapy treatments explored isolating tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes, or TILs, expanding them ex vivo and reintroducing them to the patients. The most recent advances in this field stems from efforts directed at uncoupling the signals that downregulate a T-cell response. These checkpoint inhibitors can theoretically target a number of proteins on the surface of T-cells, both the effector and regulatory T-cells, as well as myeloid-derived suppressor cells, antigen-presenting cells, or tumor cells. Still another class of immunotherapy is known as chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR T-cells. With this treatment, T-cells are modified to express an anti-tumor, antigen-specific T-cell receptor, along with co-stimulatory domains. The resulting T-cells are modified and expanded ex vivo before being returned to the patient. There are also cytokine therapies and vaccine therapies that stimulate the immune system to better fight the tumor. And all of these therapy types must be examined in the context of the microenvironment of the tumor itself. An environment that can impact the way a tumor grows, metastasizes, and ultimately reacts to the immune system. While all of these therapies have shown some promise, they are not yet at the point where any one of them works for all patients with a specific type of cancer. The work of exploring how and why these therapies do and do not work for some patients is now getting underway in earnest. And while the questions being asked become more precise and difficult to tease apart, the tools that are being used to ask these questions are, fortunately, becoming more sophisticated. The way I look at it is the technologies are geared towards a better understanding of the immune system, certainly, but the ones that have been driving the revolution allow us to measure more molecules at once. That paradigm, that, that push to measure more and more molecules at once, has kind of been happening independently of the development of the immunotherapy drugs. And now where we're at that, that meeting point, I think that what is starting to happen and will happen more and more is that these cutting edge technologies are going to now be incorporated into clinical trials and into support for whether these drugs are efficacious and safe and so on. Um, and I think as that happens, then the real power will start to emerge. If I think of my own experience working in the industry, uh, and I started in the laboratory, but now working in industry, there's this back and forth. So the scientists want to look at something and they can push the technology to a certain level and then they go back to the manufacturer and say, if only I had another laser, or if only I had more colors, or if only I could do smaller samples, or if I had an analysis software that could help me look at this cell population. And then companies look at that as an opportunity and do it. And so now that same scientist has additional tools to look deeper into their own work. While many of the technologies that are being used in immunotherapy research have been available for a long time, some of the newer tools being used have pushed the limits of science. And what scientists are looking for now require precision at the single cell level. This includes advances in next-generation sequencing, RNA-seq, multi-parameter flow cytometry, imaging mass cytometry, and much more. An important piece of this is that we want people to be educated about this because if there's no education about what technology to use, they'll either grab whatever comes along first, whatever's close by, 
or whatever the shiniest object is, which is often the case with sequencing or the sometimes the imaging mass cytometry, is really exciting technologies. And so you think to grab those first, even though they might not be right for the problem. And then we waste money and energy and our funding resources on things that um, that aren't suited to the to the questions that we want to answer. And so it's, so it's really important to understand the basic premise of why you would use each of these technologies. In this series to follow, we will look at what technologies are currently being used to further our understanding of immunotherapy. We will interview researchers in academia and in industry to find out what tools and technologies they think will help us gain a better understanding of just how the immune system works. In the next segment, we will look at how scientists are approaching tumor immune profiling and understanding the tumor microenvironment to find out exactly what techniques are being used to address these critical issues.